For those of you wondering, these are the last two northern white rhinos left in the world. And they're both female. It's sobering stuff. And the only reason I can get so close to them is because they require a 24-hour guard to protect them, and they've become used to humans. This afternoon, I want to remind you all about the value of nature. I want to tell you what we can all do to help protect the natural world, and why working in wildlife conservation is one of the most exciting, dynamic, interesting, and rewarding roles you can ever have. The idea that I want to share with you all is that there is a role for everyone in wildlife conservation. There are few things more important in the world today than what you are doing here. These inspirational words from Sir David Attenborough are written on the living wall when you enter the Sir David Attenborough building, which is home to the Cambridge Conservation Initiative and 10 of the world's leading biodiversity conservation organisations. It always inspires me when I walk through those doors and leaves me excited. And it's that excitement that I'd like to share with you all today. And I hope that you all leave here empowered to help protect the natural world too. To kick off, I want to demonstrate the value of nature. Agriculture, tourism, fishing. Fishing, which by the way, is worth 300 billion US dollars to global GDP. Medicines, energy, clean water. They're all examples of nature sustaining our economy and our welfare. Nature is the very basis of our welfare and economy, and it's critical that we manage it correctly. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honour and recognition in case of success. Sometimes I think I'm describing my current job. But this is an advert that some of you might recognise that Sir Ernest Shackleton placed in the Times in 1914. What was to follow was one of the greatest survival stories of all time and an example of inspirational leadership in adversity. So how does this connect to conservation? Well, five or, or nearly six years ago now, I was invited to, to skipper a project, an expedition that was part of a Discovery Channel documentary that was going to retrace Sir Ernest Shackleton's voyage 100 years after it first occurred. We were going to use a replica boat, such as the one you see here, and replica kit. But what we were also going to do was document climate change in the intervening years. It was simple stuff. It was what I would call citizen science. So looking, for instance, at how far the glaciers had retreated during that time. For those of you wondering, this, this is me, how I might have looked 100 years ago. Um, <laughs> stepping back in time, though, and seeing firsthand the impact of climate change really changed me, too. And during the expedition, we raised funds for an organisation called Fauna and Flora International, FFI, a biodiversity conservation organisation protecting critically endangered species and habitats. And to cut a long story short, I came back to the UK and had a lot of conversations with the CEO, bothered him for a long time, and eventually he offered me a role promoting the organisation and our global programme of work, which spans 47 countries. And the organisation has been in existence for 115 years. The role that I have is mainly in a suit, uh, working the boardrooms and conferences, um, forums, but, but sometimes I get out in the field and here I'm uh, tagging a critically endangered Antiguan racer snake. I also get to visit some of the most amazing projects all over the world. And I've been with FFI now for five years, um, but my background is actually I'm an engineer, uh, I've worked in finance, and probably, or in fact, definitely more interestingly, I was also a professional offshore sailor for 10 years, competing in events such as the Volvo Ocean Race in 2008. Um, so I've had a wide-ranging career, but I am definitely no zoologist. I didn't grow up in Africa. I don't know the Latin names of any plants. And, um, well, I suppose what I am is I'm a passionate advocate for the importance of protecting the natural world. And there are actually lots of conservationists like me that come without formal training. Of course, many of us, in fact most of us, are zoologists, ecologists, naturalists, primatologists, and fundamentally scientists. And yes, many of my colleagues grew up keeping pet worms and collecting snail shells. And yes, many of them love hugging trees. But hey, nowadays, even I enjoy doing that with my son. 
even if I am a paper conservationist. I'll come back to that. But before we get too comfortable, I think we all need a dose of reality. In 2013, 20,000 wild elephants were killed. The lion population is down 40% in the past 20 years, and there are only 3,000 tigers left in the wild. This iconic species could become extinct within our lifetime. In the last 10 years, 7,500 African rhinos have been poached. 1,000 rhino were poached in 2017. In 2010, the western black rhino sadly became extinct, and the last male northern white rhino died in March. Why all this slaughter? Well, rhino ivory is now worth in excess of 60,000 US dollars per pound. That's more than diamonds. And as a consequence, the poaching operations have become more slick. They've become more advanced. And what we need is we need military personnel leading experts in combat, in tracking, and in protecting these wildlife to work alongside our rangers and our scouts. No more so than in the Virunga National Park, which spans DRC, Rwanda, and Uganda, and is home to the critically endangered and iconic mountain gorillas. But it's also home to militia and rebel outfits, remnants of Congo's civil war. Hiding out there are also poaching and criminal gangs, and it's probably the most dangerous place in the world for a conservationist to work. 170 wildlife rangers have lost their lives there in the past 20 years. And globally, over 1,000 rangers have lost their lives in the last 15 years protecting wildlife. But it's not just on the ground that we must fight, it's also in the boardrooms and the courtrooms. Conservationists don't just protect megafauna. We also work with mining giants. We work with organizations that have the potential to cause enormous damage, such as here in Cambodia, where forests are being wiped out and the riverways are being polluted. What we need is people who understand these businesses. We need environmental impact assessment specialists. We need business specialists and strategists. We need lawyers. And fundamentally, we need people who understand these businesses and are prepared to work within them or with them. This is a paper and pulp uh, manufacturing plant in Sumatra. It's owned and operated by a company called April, one of Asia's largest um, paper and pulp manufacturers. And they are responsible for decimating huge swathes of forest across Sumatra. But they've realized the error of their ways, and they're now solely reliant on plantation timber. And our role with them is to maximize the potential of the remaining forest and to use these plantations to make wildlife corridors, crucial corridors, that allow what wildlife is left to roam free. I suppose, in summary, we've realized that to have impact, we have to engage with the people that have the potential to cause the most damage. So this is a lot of negative chat. And what I want to do now is share two stories of hope with you. The first is the International Gorilla Conservation Program. Just over 30 years ago, there was a lady called Diane Fossey who was living with the gorillas. And she realized they were at a critical point. There were only about 300 left, and their habitat was being wiped out. So who did she call? David Attenborough. David came, back, came down and saw for himself a shot film. He went back to the UK, and to cut a long story short, the International Gorilla Conservation Program, IGCP, was formed. It's a collaboration between FFI and WWF, and the story goes a little like this. If you protect the forest, you protect the critical habitat that the gorillas need. You also protect the watershed, which gives fertile lands, which means you can run sustainable agriculture programs alongside ecotourism. This guerrilla tourism, which is now worth in excess of 200 million US dollars a year, and amazingly, it's the single biggest contributor to Rwanda's GDP. Remember, it's a very small country. But the best news of all, there are now over 1,000 mountain gorillas living there. And the other thing? It brings enormous pride to the local communities, employment in an area that's been through so many troubles in its recent history. The second story is very different. It's about two twins I met six months ago. Now, these are very intelligent and worldly guys. And what sets them apart is they come from enormous privilege. Um, they've always been interested in nature, but they're not conservationists. They've never really been to Africa. They've never experienced the savanna grasslands. And they've never crossed an ocean. They certainly didn't keep pet worms and collect snail shells. 
But the thing is, they loved Sir David Attenborough. And one day, as only people like this can do, they decided, you know what? This guy makes sense. We're going to write to him and ask what he can do. And again, to cut a long story short, Sir David introduced me to them. And I took them to Africa to see our major projects, which included the iconic mountain gorillas. They've lifted the lid, and Africa has got under their skin. They've seen, heard, and felt what real nature is like. And we now have two new lifelong conservationists who come with power, influence, and significant resources that they're making available to help us in this battle. Now, these are good news stories that I believe we should celebrate, and we should celebrate them together. This is a tower of giraffes, by the way, because collaboration is key to success. There are many examples within the NGO world, but I just want to quickly pick up on something called Wild Labs. It's a community of conservationists, technologists, engineers, data scientists, change makers. And what they do is they get together and they share ideas, they share technological innovation, tools, and they're coming up with new solutions to age-old conservation problems. In short, the conservation world is recruiting for new skills. So who else do we need? Well, we need people who, in suits who can talk a bit better than me. But, but I really think that we need to maybe follow the lead of men like Shackleton. We need to explore new areas. We need to summon our spirit of adventure. And we need to take this battle to the front line, wherever that may be. We need to gently guide and educate people who do not yet understand the value of nature. Many years ago, I heard Sir David Attenborough talking about real conservationists and paper conservationists. He was actually describing the incredible credentials of my boss. What he inadvertently did was raise the question of whether you need to be out chasing poachers, wrangling crocs, or working with um, Sumatran tigers, such as this amazing species. There's only 400 of them left in the world. To call yourself a real conservationist. Well, I think we all know the answer is that both are critical. And what matters is the effort, the passion, and the purpose that you go about your job with. So to sum up, there is a lot of negativity out there. There is nothing the world's media loves more. But I believe there are chinks of light. We've heard today from leaders across all sorts of different sectors. But if we get together and we work together, and we ask ourselves some deep questions, and we look at our priorities and how far ahead we're thinking, I believe we can make real progress, and not just in the conservation world. Of course, we need scientists, but we also need engineers, lawyers, accountants, soldiers, language experts, sales and marketing experts, branding experts. There is a role for pretty much anyone in the world of wildlife conservation. And we need to remember that nature is the very basis of our welfare and economy, and we cannot go on taking without paying back. <laughs>